One of the defining traits of the late Middle Ages is that it was a period where we have some fairly sophisticated and large states which can field equally sophisticated and large armies. So I think that it's only fitting that before we get into that um, period proper, we need to talk about the way that warfare is now conducted and maybe bust a couple myths along the way. And one thing that I think becomes quickly apparent is that the year 1300 is a key point in the history of warfare because it's that around this year, give or take a decade or so, when we see most of the innovations which really characterize the late Middle Ages taking place. So let's look at the various unit types, um, ethical codes, and weaponry of the late Middle Ages. When you think the words medieval warfare, the most natural image to come to mind is that of the mounted knight. At its most basic, a knight is nothing more than a professional mounted warrior who wears armor. Um, social practice, however, dictates that knights are almost always people from the lower elite. Now, obviously, people from the middle and upper elite also equip themselves as knights when they ride in the battle, but they are defined by other functions in life, not by their role as knights. Um, so these are guys who are at the very bottom of the rung of the very long and nuanced ladder of nobility, which um, I have never bothered to try to explain because it varies from country to country and is pretty complex. And oftentimes rank and power don't quite go together because of the size of a holding or one's personal relationships with other lords or whatever the case might be. It's a pretty chaotic system when we're talking about feudalism. At any rate... Um, to be a knight, you have to have years of training and lots of skill, and this is why it really um, favors the sort of leisured elite and why many of these guys have to have relationships with higher lords so these guys can just be professional soldiers and dedicate themselves to learning all of the skills required. Not to mention that owning a horse is also very expensive. Um, even in today's world, most horses cost more than most cars. Um, if we look at the 11th century knights, the same knights who conquered England under William the Conqueror and also the guys who fought the First Crusade, we're talking about knights who aren't nearly as heavy as sort of our typical mental image of a knight. These are guys who rode horses which weren't um, armored, and they would have worn some fairly standard chain mail. They would have had spears, swords, all that kind of stuff. But it was hard for them to actually get their horses to charge in that modern sense. And they could get their horses to ride towards stuff quickly, but in terms of actually hammering home a charge and really just hitting a line, that was something that was difficult in this period. Not to say impossible, just not something that was uh, all that doable. We know that at the Battle of Hastings, for instance, in England, that the Norman knights would ride up to the Anglo-Saxon lines and toss their spears or try to... Um, you know, as they're turning around, get a good slashing with their swords. So stuff like that was how knights would fight in the 11th century. However, um, once they succeeded with a few charges in the Middle East and they realized that a lot of the Turks and Arabs didn't really use armor, they figured out that they could just bust through lines straight up. So um, horse breeding technology sort of allowed for this to some extent because horses got bigger and stronger and by around the 12th or 13th century, if my memory serves me correctly, this is when horses reach their modern size. And we also see that armor is becoming more elaborate, not necessarily heavier in terms of poundage, but it's becoming much more elaborate and complex and more protective. So um, that is a result of metallurgy advances, which are also going on at the same time. And that results in the late medieval night. The difference between a high medieval and a late medieval knight is simply the degree of complexity of that person's equipment. Um, later knights are also able to add armor to their horses. This is because of advancements in armor and metallurgy and you know being able to shape it to a horse's body that's part of it, but also the horses are now bigger and stronger so they can take the extra weight. Um, and now we see that they also are able to do full-fledged charges in that sort of Rome total war sense where, you know, literally the horses will crash into a wall of infantry. 
And the way that they accomplish that is that they have to overcome the horse's natural instinct to avert collision. Horses are wild animals, um, and they are accustomed to trying to avoid danger. And also, you know, they don't want to hurt their legs by running into something. So they have to be conditioned from a young age to obey, and they also have to be, have blinders so that way they don't see all the danger around them, and they're calmer going into battle. Also, uh, horse training is even more complex because um, if you really wanted to take a horse to the east where you might face an elephant, you have to make sure that the horse has smelled an elephant and won't instantly panic at the smell. Anyway, that's a bit of a tangent. So, and some other innovations, which again deal with metallurgy and with you know the needs of these elite patrons who are willing to shell out lots of money to get the best and latest weapons. Swords get longer, maces are sometimes used, um, and the reason to use a mace is because when the armor gets really elaborate and effective, it's sometimes hard to pierce it. But you can still do a lot of damage to someone if you take a great weight and slam it on the armor, because then that impact will go into their body and you can break bones and knock people off their horses and stuff like that. So um, those are some weapons which emerge. Also, you have lances, uh, which are, you know are basically just an evolution from spears. And um, as time progresses, we'll see that knights actually have to be integrated into armies which use something like an early form of combined arms. So knights are just one unit in an army, and they have other units that support them or um, you know supplement them in some way, which is something that I guess people are less likely to think of when they think of medieval warfare. However, these other units are equally important, and we'll talk about them. But first, while we're on the topic of knights, let's take a look at the Code of Chivalry. Another thing that springs to mind when you think of either medieval warfare or just the Middle Ages in general is this idea of a code of chivalry. Well, this is something that goes all the way back to about Charlemagne's time when we're talking about the idea of how knights should behave themselves, but this takes a long time to evolve. And interestingly enough, some of the major bases for chivalry are fictional work, like um, Geoffrey of Monmouth's accounts of King Arthur, which are made up by Geoffrey of Monmouth for the most part. And after we have works like that, we see that chivalry reaches a mature, but by no means completely finished, version around the year 1200 or so. And we see that what this code does is it tries to regulate knightly behavior and courtship rituals. So basically, this is something which is, at its heart, designed to regulate relationships between different nobles. So what are some of the tenets of chivalry? Well, you have to be courteous and respectful to your equals. So you have to treat them according to their station. Um, and if I had to really summarize chivalry, it's all about finding out someone else's station in life and treating them according to what they deserve due to that station in life. If someone is a higher rank, say if you're just a regular knight and you work for a count, then you have to treat that person with deference because that person is better than you. Um, you also have to be loyal to the church and its teachings. So um, normally your obligation is to do whatever your Lord tells you, but if your Lord told you to do something that's against the teachings of the church, then your obligation becomes to uphold your religious values. So there are a, there is a little bit of interpretation built into chivalry. However, this does not apply to common men and women. So if you're a knight, you're under no obligation to treat commoners the same way you would treat your equals and superiors. And one way that this plays out is with courtship rituals. So if you're courting a woman of equal rank, you have to treat her with the utmost respect. If you're courting a woman of superior rank, you're sort of just an admirer. You can't really be with her. And a classic example is when, say, a king has a beautiful wife and one of his lords or knights will flirt with the woman and bring her flowers, write her poetry, but it's understood that she's too good for him and that that will never go anywhere or actually be anything. Um, however, if you're a knight and there's a peasant woman that you like, you just ride into her village and rape her. Yes, I mean, that's basically how it works.
Um, when I say that they do not have to respect commoners, I'm not kidding. It was not uncommon for knights to raid their own territory and steal things, beat people up, rape women. Um, that was very common behavior. And that's actually one of the reasons why peasants start to develop their own weaponry and form their own militias and why towns start to try to go their own way and don't want to be a part of a feudal hierarchy that involves some of these abusive lords with their thuggish knights. Arguably the best known, albeit very geographically limited, peasant weapon is the English longbow. And this gives you the added advantage of being able to fight from a distance rather than having to get up close and personal with dudes wearing custom crafted armor. Um, the English longbow seems to have evolved from an earlier Welsh design, and it seems to have been something that the Welsh used to great effect against the Normans during the 12th century when the Normans invaded Wales. And when they finalized it, this was a bow which was six feet long. And because of the amount of draw strength that you had to put into it, and because it's an unwieldy weapon in an age where most people were not six feet tall, uh, this is something that you have to start training for from a young age. So militias using longbows will start training boys from you know about the age of like five or six or something like that. And only after that lifetime of training will you be truly proficient and effective. Now, when you do develop that level of skill and upper body strength, however, this weapon is brutal. Um, it has great range, especially if you tilt it up. That's one thing about a bow that you can do to extend its range. You can fire it at an angle. And one common longbow tactic was to um, fire one volley at an angle and then fire another volley dead ahead and then have the two air uh, volleys land at the same time. That way, if you're firing an infantry, it's hard for them to shield both their heads and their torsos at the same time. Um, so, you know, is demoralizing and effective. Um, so, another big advantage of the longbow is that if you know how to use it and you have the upper body stamina and strength, then you can fire at a pretty fast rate. So, if you've got a unit of longbowmen, they can really rain down arrows, and we'll see that a lot in the Hundred Years' War. This is, the Hundred Years' War is basically a demonstration of the potential of the English longbow in a pitched battle. So the English army will deploy these as regiments, which will work in conjunction with heavy infantry and knights, and that will be sort of the first um, combined arms army since the Roman army in Western Europe. And uh, it will prove to be pretty effective, and it's this sort of combined arms army which can utilize the English longbow to great effect, which will enable England to fight the much larger uh, French throne and come fairly close to conquering France and creating a unified France and England. So let's say that you're not English and you're still a peasant soldier in the Middle Ages and you are assigned to shoot arrows and bolts at things. What weapon will you use? Well, there's the regular bow, but that thing's not going to really pierce armor. So what you need is a crossbow. Now the crossbow is something that had been in use since about the 6th century BCE in China. It had been developed during the Warring States period there. And by the 4th century, this had become well-known in Greece. It's attested in a number of texts from the time. And uh, you know, everything the Greeks had, the Romans then used on a mass scale. So the Romans also know of quite a few crossbows, including basically giant crossbows that they used as field artillery. Um, uh, medieval crossbows are weapons which had a lot of power, but they do have... A slow rate of fire. The mechanism has to be wound back. Sometimes there's a crank um, and sometimes you have to put your foot on it and sort of push it down. So sometimes these things can take a little while to reload. And they're not as accurate as a longbow. Um, a part of it is because when these things are produced, uh, you know, the craftsmanship can sometimes be a bit uh, shaky. It's a bit uneven, obviously, just like all other weapon systems, it improves over time. But you know, crossbows, because of their mechanical complexity, don't tend to age well. So if you're using an older one, say one that's seen a few battles, you might have a slow rate of fire and your bolts might not be terribly accurate. 
These things are relatively inexpensive, however. Um, none of the parts are all that hard to make if you have a smithy. And these things are also relatively easy to figure out once you've done a little bit of practice. So an estimate is that if you were training for six weeks with a crossbow, you would become reasonably proficient. Not an expert, but you would be good enough to you know, be part of a line firing a volley of crossbow bolts that could deter a charge or at least slow one down. So because of its relative um, low cost and you know, ease of use, this thing is very popular with city militias and peasants. But because it can pierce a knight's armor and result in the death of a knight, uh, this is hated by knights. They don't think it's fair for some peasant to be able to pick up a crossbow, train for a few weeks, and then hold their own in a battle. They think that it's up to peasants to show up without armor and fight fairly um, against someone who's a professional warrior. That's the sort of nobility's idea of what a fair fight is. Um, obviously the peasants disagree and they do value their own lives. And because, just like with anything, some soldiers will be better than others, there are actually professional crossbow units for hire during the Middle Ages. Um, mostly these units are composed of Italians from the various city-states of northern Italy, many of whom are political exiles and they will often fight for other powers. There are a lot of Italian crossbowmen, for instance, in the service of the French king during the late Middle Ages. Longbows and crossbows are very effective at dealing with knights at a distance, but what if the knights happen to close in on you? After all, these guys are on horses and are not just going to stand there and get pounded by arrows all day. Well, you need a weapon to fight back with and you need something that can kind of negate the mobility that um, a knight has. And the best way to do that is with some sort of pike. Now, there are a wide variety of weapons that fill this role. Some are more like halberds. Some are basically just long, very sturdy spears. Um, it doesn't really matter what it is as long as it's long and has a lot of durability and ability to take punishment. So, these weapons are supposed to be an equalizer. They're stuff that you can either use individually or in formations. And the idea is that if a pike formation is deployed and they're putting up a spear wall, that an unsupported charge will most likely fail. And the only way that a charge might have a good chance of succeeding is if knights can be supported by archers who will then kill some of the pikemen and disorganize them so the knights can then hit them. At any rate, um, what are some of these weapons? Well, one is called the Gudentag, and this is sort of a combination of a pike and a club. So one end is just like a traditional big spear thing, and the other end is a sort of um, club or mace-like thing that is used for uh, punching and just uh, you know hitting armor and trying to injure the person beneath it. And this weapon is developed by Flemish peasants, uh, Flanders being the area north of France, basically what is now um, Belgium and uh, Holland. And this sort of uh, weapon allows for a famous victory that the Flemish had over the French in 1302. Obviously, knights are not too fond of these kind of weapons either. Um, and this idea quickly spread. Not that it was a new idea. Obviously, Alexander the Great had lots of pikemen in his uh, army. But this idea is now coming back in a big way right around 1300. Anyway, the Scots also deployed pikemen at Bannockburn in 1314. We normally think of the Highlanders with their long claymore swords, but pikemen were also a very important part of the Scottish army. Um, and Scotland had fewer knights and cavalry in general than Britain, so it was very important for them to deploy these pikes in order to sort of counter the weight of the English mounted troops. But the most famous of all pikemen by a long shot are the Swiss pike mercenaries. And these are guys who before about the year 1490 were probably the most highly coveted of all mercenaries in Europe. And even for over a century after that, when we're well into the gunpowder age, 
um, pikemen will continue to be used to defend musketeers from charges from cavalry or to fight when uh, you know it's raining and muskets won't work properly. So um, the pike will actually outlast the other weapons that we're talking about or that we've talked about up to this point. When you imagine medieval warfare, not only do you imagine knights, but you imagine them coming out of a castle and across a drawbridge, or maybe going through a drawbridge into a castle. Either way. Castles actually started out fairly simplistic in the earlier period, and a lot of them were just wooden castles, so basically just a big house with a moat around it. And this is mostly just to intimidate peasants and to serve as a deterrent for, say, a peasant revolt or something like that. However, as war becomes more organized and external threats become more serious, these walls will become heavier and made out of stone. They'll, um, they'll put towers along the walls, sally ports, which are basically doors that people can come out of in order to launch raids on the people trying to attack the castle. Um, gates are areas of major entry and exit, and they form sort of uh, bottlenecks of defense. And all these things evolve over time. Um, now, all these things had existed in antiquity, but um, they won't really make a big comeback in the Middle Ages until the High Middle Ages when the wealth of Europe is recovering. Now, two places are really the places where innovations happen during for castle design. One is in the Holy Roman Empire because everybody has to have a castle, and as this thing splinters and splinters and splinters, um, you'll need defenses because you'll have 15 neighbors who are other noble claimants to different stuff, and they'll all have their own castles, and, you know, all of them are within like an hour's walk of your place. So, got to have a good fortified area. And, of course, the Crusades provided lots of other um, design ideas, not only because they encountered different architecture in the Middle East, but because they were largely an undermanned force um, out on their own and they needed their defenses to be as good as possible to make up for their lack of numbers. In addition, some uh, castle designers would visit old Roman forts and start studying and imitating their designs and incorporating elements of Roman fort making into medieval forts. Now, castles are different than your normal forts, however, because they also serve as a center of administration and residence for lords. So if you're the lord, you live in the castle, and what counts for your bureaucracy, which is usually just your household staff, will also conduct business there. And peasants will bring their um, taxes there, and they'll bring their grievances there. So the castle has some non-military functions as well. The problem is, one of the other things we're going to talk about is gunpowder. And in the 15th century, gunpowder weapons reach enough complexity and effectiveness that castles are more or less obsolete. And after a little while, even the nobles who are traditionalists figure that out. And construction of castles basically stops in the 16th century. There's a revival in the 18th, but at that point, they are just for looks and it's a sort of romanticism about castles and these things are not actually made for any kind of military purpose. Catapults were invented by the ancient Greeks around the year 400 or so since the Greeks engaged in a lot of sieges during the Peloponnesian War. And these things would evolve over time and from the time they were invented all the way up until well into the 14th century Catapults were the primary enemy of the walled settlement, whether it be a city with defensive walls or a castle or a Roman fort or what have you. And there are many different varieties of catapults to choose from. Uh, one is called the ballista, and this is basically just a giant crossbow. Um, and these are usually more useful for either battering specific targets like gates or trying to kill personnel. Um, so these things are accurate, but they're not very mobile. So once you set it up and it's facing a direction, you're going to have a lot of trouble trying to maneuver it. And it only fires in a straight line, so the range can be a bit 
less than you'd like. Sort of the most typical catapult of the Middle Ages is the mangonel, and this is the one that will be used for most of the battles up until the invention of the trebuchet. And this is something that's pretty easy to construct. It um, has a bowl-shaped bucket at the end of the arm, which will also be part of the arm. So it's just a big wooden thing, looks like a spoon. And then you put whatever you want in the bowl and fire it. Um, the mangonels are characterized by having a wild jerking movement when they're fired, so you had to be careful if you're working on the catapult. And this is the most typical form of catapult. And of course, uh, one of the best, w best things to fire, other than balls, which you use to either hit people or knock down walls, you can also fire dead animals or diseased corpses to try to spread disease. Because while people in the Middle Ages didn't have the most sophisticated understanding of disease, they did understand that um, people who are around sick people tended to get sick as well. But the sort of catapult par excellence is the trebuchet. And this is basically just a much, much better version of a mangonel. Um, and this only appears in the early 14th century, so again, right around 1300 in England, where Edward I of the Ninth Crusade fame built a giant trebuchet and knocked down the walls of Stirling Castle. And the thing pictured on the screen, those are trebuchets. You see that here you, it, you have basically the long arm and then a slingshot. And this provided a lot more power and range than the mangonel. But still basically did the same thing. And now for the first time we can actually talk about a few dates which occur after 1300. Let's talk about like 1350-ish. And that is when the earliest firearms will reach Europe. Now, um, there are prototypes in China as early as the 9th century, but it takes a while for something that actually looks like a gun to the modern eye to really evolve. And these start to appear in Europe yeah, around the mid to late 14th century in relatively small quantities. And at first, these weapons are not very practical, and they're heavy enough that they actually have to be put on stands. And um, because gunpowder can't work when it's wet. This isn't really the most practical weapon and it will take a very long time to completely displace the crossbow. However, in the late 14th century, Italy develops the hand cannon, which is a practical weapon that you can actually carry around with you and which is basically just a much more powerful upgrade to the crossbow. Um, and the weapon will evolve enough that by the late 15th century, the Ottoman army will have entire units which are all using these weapons. But they'll also still have archers and a lot of other stuff mixed in. However, it's around this period when musketeers start to become really uh, standard issue kind of things in armies. And because these guns will have so much firepower they will render heavy body armor obsolete. And at this point, the sort of race between increasing firepower and increasingly complex armor is over. Um, so some knights had managed to, by further developing their armor, you know, really negate the crossbow and longbow to some extent. So whereas like a high medieval knight would be taken down by a crossbow, a late medieval knight, not necessarily. But then once you get the gun in the play, well, now it's over. Now these, uh, you know, the sort of heavy metal armor will no longer be sufficient to keep a lead ball out of someone's chest. So this is a major game changer, and the development of muskets like this will be probably the most obvious uh, technological change that will mark the difference between late medieval warfare and sort of early modern warfare. Along with the appearance of hand cannons, the gunpowder revolution also ushered in the age of cannons and mortars, which displaced catapults and ballistas. So these things are usually known as bombards, and they began to appear in Europe by the early 14th century. And at first, they're really not that much better than catapults. Um, they basically do the same function, but they require more resources, they're more expensive, and you have to have gunpowder. Um, and 
the 14th century bombards were not large or powerful enough to really penetrate some of the latest and greatest castle walls. So at first, this thing was a new invention, but it wasn't a game changer. And then in the 15th century, everything changed because um, metallurgy continued to improve, so cannon designs improved accordingly, and they became bigger, heavier, and more durable. And because cannons were still so expensive, they heavily favored powers who had a lot of money and really created a lot of disadvantages for powers which were poorer. So, in other words, if you're someone in deep decline like the Byzantine Empire, the Gunpowder Revolution is a really bad thing. If you're relatively wealthy, like one of the Italian city-states or the Ottomans, this Gunpowder Revolution now makes you a great deal more powerful. And in the 15th century, from about 1450 all the way until the 1490s, we'll see that cannons prove again and again and again that building new fortresses would be a complete waste of resources. It begins with the fall of Constantinople, which had been Europe's most impressive fortress for well over a thousand years. And it continues when um, you know the Spanish are able to complete the Reconquista and batter down the um, defenses of the Kingdom of Granada, which it held for 250 years by that point. So um, this is the major innovation which really brought an end to uh, castles and all of that stuff. And when, combined with the development of firearms, which made knight's armor obsolete, it's really these new gunpowder weapons which sort of... Um, are a part of late medieval warfare and also the thing which ultimately ends medieval warfare. But we won't really get into the era when uh, these weapons become the dominant weapons on the battlefield, so I think we can leave it here.